Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schatz and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department. We've been moving sequentially, so we started with, with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we will be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you do have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last slide of the presentation today. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTAC can offer. Set Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important sources, thought, and solicitation announcements, providing details so you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. Please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. And you can contact Alicia Field with the email shown on your screen if you have any questions. Federal contracting is a relationship game. Now get in front of your federal human sooner with the exclusive players and layers method from Judy Bratt and Summit Insight. Connect with her on LinkedIn and find out more or visit growfedbiz.com today. Okay, and now a little bit about us. Um, we work with US federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance, and more information can be found on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 23,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. I also wanted to inform you of a new series that we're holding this year. We have launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. This is a live webinar series held each month, and these will take place on the second Friday of each month this year in 2021 at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. Those panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. So for example, this month our panelists covered proposal writing and next month on August 13th, our panelists will be covering compliance. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants and other industry professionals and you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are, are available. Please email hello at jennifershouse.com for a media kit with pricing details. Also, please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each of these webinars. Okay, now to introduce our speaker, Mike Gwynn. Welcome, Mike. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Hunter. I appreciate that. Um, hello, uh, so my name is Mike Wynn. I would like to thank you for listening, whether you're live or on the recording. Uh, Hunter, could you please go to the slide DFARS Part 232, the big picture? Thank you. 
So to begin with, I think it's important to situate DFARS Part 232 within the broader federal acquisition regulations. Uh, if you were to just look at DFARS Part 232, its text, it would probably be very confusing. There are large gaps in the text where the DOD has decided not to supplement the FAR Part 32. And sometimes it will start in the middle of the process where they just want to add an additional step or direct the review towards a certain office that uh, in a process that's already outlined in part uh, in FAR Part 32. So whenever you have a question about uh, DFARS Part 232, it's best to start with FAR Part 32. That's oftentimes where the, um, the information is going to be. So with that said, uh, we have uh, one of the points here we'd all, I'd like, also like to make is, is that the point of DFARS Part 232 and FAR Part 32 is to provide working capital for contractors. So for smaller contracts on short time frames, you probably will not need much in the way of contract financing involvement from the government, uh, especially if you already have the inventory and you are selling widgets to the government. However, for much larger projects that might take months or years to perform, it can be difficult for a, con for a contractor to finance the entire contract performance. That is where uh, Part 32 and DFARS Part 232 really come into the picture. Uh, two other points uh, we need to make is, is first is that one thing that you always need to keep in mind when looking at DFARS Part 232 is that it heavily addresses fiscal law issues. Uh, this is a very complex and difficult field. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this presentation. But the two big things to think about are the Anti-Assignment Act and the Anti-Deficiency Act, which I'll come back to throughout the presentation. The takeaway for the Anti-Assignment Act is that the government wants to do business with the person that they contracted with. And so they have many restrictions in the contract and outside of the contract to prevent a contractor from passing off performance to somebody else uh, after a contract award. The Anti-Deficiency Act is a almost constitutional law question. It's, uh, the main takeaway is, is that if Congress has not given the agency the money to spend, the agency can't promise it or obligate it. And there are many hard checks within DFARS Part 232 to keep contracting officers from overstepping those boundaries. It's always worth to keep those two things in mind whenever you're dealing with the government. Uh, because they might not always be obvious at the face of your interactions with the contracting officer. Uh, the final point is, is that the FAR consists of rules that give enforceable rights to contractors, and it also consists of rules that are administrative guidance to contracting officers that do not provide rights to contractors. An example of a set of rules that um, provides right to contractors is FAR Part 15 in regards to bid protests. Uh, and the thing is, is that Part 32 has not been addressed by courts or boards very much. So it is hard to give you advice on what parts of FAR Part 232, uh, I'm sorry, DFARS Part 232 or FAR Part 32 give you a right that you might actually be able to enforce against the government. Okay, so uh, next slide, please, Hunter. So there are five steps in a typical procurement, the, solic the solicitation, the award, performance, the assessment of contract debts, and uh, contract completion. Contract financing and, DFAR and FAR Part 32, DFARS Part 232 can come into play at any step in this process. They address how money is going to be handled and when it will change hands. So if you have questions about how to handle electronic transfers of funds, progress payments, or invoicing, those rules will probably be found in FAR Part 32 or DFARS Part 232. Next slide, please. The next big picture thing to keep in mind about contracting finance, contract financing under the FAR is that the government has a preference to limit its risk. And so what that means is that it does not want to give the contractor any money until it gets its performance. And so, as you can see here in its order of preference, it has uh, its most preferred option for contract financing is private financing. And that is where the contractor goes to its bank and either secures a line of credit, a loan, something similar like that, 
and the government doesn't cut a check to the contractor until the, the contract is completed. Uh, from there, you work your way down to customary contract financing. Examples can be found in FAR 32.113. Uh, a good example within there is financing of shipbuilding or ship conversion, alteration or repair when the agency regulations provide for progress payments, uh, loan guarantees, unusual contract payment, contract financing, and finally, the least preferred option is advanced payments, and that's where the government puts the money up front, and then they get the deliverable afterwards. So remember when negotiating with the government that uh, if you want unusual contract financing, the contracting officer is going to have to work his way all the way down to that level in this priority. Next slide, please. So now that we've addressed those preliminary issues, talking about contract financing generally within the federal acquisition regulations, uh, we can move on to how the DFARS supplements those regulations. Next slide, please. Subpart 232 addresses much of the preliminary administrative matters, especially uh, it identifies the important offices within the Department of Defense that handle these uh, regulations. Uh, also sets a few policy guidelines, so how to uh, DOD's policy for financing payments as quickly as possible. And additionally, you can find any any questions you have about whether or not how to present your case that you are a financially responsible contractor can be found in subpart 232. Next slide, please. Uh, so, subpart 232.1, um, it is not a very detailed piece of guidance. It is very much so a supplement to the guidance that's in FAR Part 32. Uh, the key takeaway here, though, is, is, again, it's meant to limit the government's risk, their financial risk, uh, if there is a default. So, as you can see here, 232.102E2 limits progress payments. Um, based on percentage of or stage of completion to only construction or shipbuilding and maintenance contracts. And I think this makes intuitive sense when you think about it because you can have 50% of a building or 50% of a repaired ship. You might not be able to get 50% of some type of report. Uh, next slide. Again, uh, subpart 232.2 .2 provides fairly limited guidance on its own. It needs to be read in conjunction with FAR Part 32. Uh, the few additional things that should be kept in mind is that a determination of financial responsibility is not the same as a determination that the contractor is providing adequate security for contract performance. So bear that in mind that even if you meet the financial responsibility requirements, uh, defined in subpart 232.0, there may be some additional requirement that the contracting officer asks you to meet to meet that adequate security requirement. Next slide, please. Um, so this is an interesting point, and it may change in future years, but generally speaking, the Department of Defense is the only department that can provide loan guarantees as a form of contract financing. However, the DOD has not actually requested that authority in recent years, and that is a quote from the DFARS. And so right now, the DOD cannot offer loan guarantees. Um, that may change in future years if the Department of Defense decides that that would be helpful and they ask Congress and Congress grants it. Next slide. Subpart 232.5 provides a significant amount of supplemental regulation to the rules found at FAR Part 32. The big thing to remember here is that it is meant to keep the contracting officer from overrunning the funds obligated to the contract by Congress. And so as you can see here, the contracting officer can't give you progress payments in excess of a certain percentage of the amounts uh, provided or the contract price. Next slide. So for subpart 232.4, uh, the big 
take away from this is that it provides for the government to set up advanced payment pools. And what that means is, is that all of the contracts in a given contractor's portfolio that allow for advanced payments can have the money for the advanced payments pooled into one account, and the payments are just made out of that. This dramatically simplifies contract administration, especially on the government side, and it's something to bring up if you're having headaches with getting funds uh, released from your, for advanced payments. Next slide. Subpart 232.6 uh, discusses contract debts. It's mainly an instruction manual to contracting officers to uh, how to assess, report, and process contract debts. And a contract debt is where the contractor owes the government. And it's important to remember that one of the contracting officer's roles is to protect taxpayer fund funding. And so whenever the contracting officer determines that the government has overpaid, even if the government is very pleased with the results, you can expect the government to attempt to pursue um, that overpayment. Next slide, please. Subpart 232.7, contract funding. Uh, the key idea here is that this is meant to address the Anti-Deficiency Act. So with an incrementally funded contract, that means that the all of the money that will be needed to perform the contract or to pay it off the contract has not yet been committed by Congress. And so there's a host of restrictions on incremental funding because of the Anti-Deficiency Act implications as we've been discussing throughout this. And so what you need to remember whenever you're discussing an incrementally funded contract is that they always carry the risk that due to political maneuvering on the Hill, uh, the funding will get cut, and then the contracting officer is then obligated to terminate the contract for convenience. And so it is worth having a conversation with the contracting officer early and often about how much funding has been obligated to the contract, and it's also worth making sure that you know uh, whether or not the agency is going to push for more funding to finish out the contract. Next slide, please. Subpart 232.8 supplements FAR Part 32.8 in its uh, instructions to contracting officers about assignment and contractors in regard to assignment of claims. An assignment of claims is where somebody who has a contract and they have rights under that contract uh, gives trades their rights under that contract to somebody else. So for instance, if Hunter has a contract with the government, I come up and I give, con I give Hunter $500 and now I have his rights under the contract. The government does not like this. They do not want to contract with Hunter on Monday and then be doing business with me on Wednesday without getting a phone call about it. And so this is one of the steps for the contracting officer to approve assignments, whatever those assignments may be, and uh, they really very much should be followed. Uh, one example of, of assignments of claims that frequently happens is uh, where you will assign your rights to payment under the contract to your bank in order to obtain financing. So the bank fronts you 90% of the contract value, 80% of the contract value, and then as the payments come in, the payments go directly to the bank to pay off that financing. Next slide, please. Uh, subpart 232.9 has the DOD's supplemental regu regulations addressing prompt payment. The major takeaway for contractors to remember here is that many of the prompt payment protections can be waived if there is a natural disaster or an emergency. The thinking behind this is that the Department of Defense, the government does not want to be held up from assisting in a crisis or in a war zone because of contract payment matters and disputes over invoices and all the rest of that. Uh, so. It is always worth remembering that if a contract is of the sort that it may have to be performed during an emergency, there may be delays in payment. The government is very good about paying uh, its contractors, but during an emergency or a crisis, the emergency or crisis is going to take priority and you may have to, your invoices may take longer to be paid. 
Next slide, please. Uh, subpart 232.10, performance-based payments, uh, provides the DOD supplemental regulations for these. Um, the, the main main regulations can be found in FAR Part 32. Uh, one of the most important takeaways here for contractors is that the contractor must be GAAP compliant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, subpart 232.11, governs electronic funds tra transfer. There is uh, a strong preference within the Department of Defense for electronic funds transfer due to increased transparency, auditability, and uh, just a greater degree of control over the flow of money that the government can exercise over it. Next slide, please. Uh, subpart 232.7 provides the DOD's guidance on invoicing. So the DOD requires all invoices uh, or other payment requests to be submitted electronically. There are some key exceptions, as we can see here. I think that they make intuitive sense. The government does not want you sending invoices that could reveal classified information over an unclassified system. And so they have a separate system for that. Um, and also situations where access to the electronic system might not be available. So uh, contracts are being performed under extreme circumstances in an emergency or a crisis. Uh, it may just be all paper because uh, the contracting officer and the relevant personnel don't have access to the systems. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Subpart 232.70, this is continued from the previous slide, uh, just shows that wide area workflow is the default electronic payment. I think that one thing that is very important is that, so 232.7002B2, I put it in bold and underlined, facsimile, email, and scan documents are not acceptable. Electronic forms of payment requests are receiving reports. And this is important because if the contractor does not comply with this and is um, doesn't have one of the exceptions apply, there's no agreement that one of the exceptions apply, and is using a email or, fax, or faxing documents to the government, the government might have a position to just not process those payments. And that can cause some huge headaches for everyone involved. So it is absolute best to either use wide area workflow or to get it in writing from the contracting officer that some other method of processing payments will be used. Next slide. Uh, subpart 232.71 outlines the process for addressing IRS levies on DOD contracts. So if a contractor owes the government or owes the IRS money uh, for delinquent tax payments, garnishment, et cetera, then the IRS is able to actually take the payment that the DOD would otherwise pay to the contractor directly. So the, the money will never even pass through the contractor's hand. Um, you can get exemptions to this and uh, subpart 232.71 outlines the complete process. Uh, the key individual involved will be the Director of Defense Procurement Acquisition Policy. But it's important to remember that this process starts with the contracting officer. So if you have reason to believe that the IRS may want to get involved into your contract payments as a contractor, then it's very important to get in, get in touch with the contracting officer and bring it to their attention immediately in writing and to try and get that pushed up the chain of command. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the last substantive slide. With, with current developments, it's not clear how much longer this will be relevant. However, uh, whenever the DOD is doing business with Afghan contractors, the Afghan contractor must be paid in Afghani, which is the regional currency, which is the currency in Afghanistan, um, into by electronic funds transfer to a bank account with an Afghan financial institution. So the government can't pay U.S. dollars to Afghan contractors. Uh, next slide. So uh, that sums up all of my detail analysis, I'd like to leave you with three final takeaways. Uh, those are that 
So the government does not want to pay for the contract before the contract is performed. And so uh, the government will shy away from contract financing. If you can get agreeable terms from a private uh, contract financer, that will most likely be the easiest way to do it. However, there are options available if needed. Uh, contract financing and any time government money is involved are subject to fiscal law considerations. And so if you have questions about how the money should be handled or when payments will come in or questions about uh, how much money Congress is obligated, that's something that needs to be addressed earlier on because it can have ramifications to contract performance. And finally, and I think this is probably most important to understanding the DFARS as a whole, and in particular DFARS Part 232, is that the DFARS is the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement. So it is the DOD's supplement to the FAR. If you have questions with the DFARS, always start with the FAR and then work your way back in. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, you can contact me with at my email address and, or at that phone number provided. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for a great presentation and for sharing your time with us today. Um, and like he said, Definitely reach out if you have any questions with the information on your screen right now. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us for this webinar. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS.